doing something really crazy today by having two shows, but uh, there are two subjects that I really wanted to touch on uh, this week, and I didn't want to wait uh, for next week to come to do it. Uh, we've been able to do that and no one leave feeling a certain way. Uh, but we do want to have an honest conversation. I first want to introduce my guest and she'll correct me if I'm wrong. So I may say, I may pronounce your name wrong, but uh, just give me one moment. Okay, I'm going to. Can y'all? We're watching you. Uh huh. Can y'all hear me now? I think everyone said that they're saying that my sound is a little off, but can you hear me? Just to make sure that you all can, and it's not spotty. Okay. Okay. Give me one second. Upstairs, uh, so it's not so spotty. And let me know before we get started if it's spotty. Yeah, I see it now. So we're gonna reconnect upstairs. How's that? Is it getting better? Okay, not anymore. Awesome. So we're going to move it around here before we get started. Okay, is that better for you guys? Let me see some hearts if it's better for you. It is? Awesome. Okay. <laughs> we have the, everyone's home, everyone's 
if you're an artist or any kind of speaker or whatever, you're getting used to getting this whole uh, technology thing right when we're home. So just move to, I hi, I hear you. You can hear me. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Yay. Okay, perfect. So we're going to get some of this technology. We have different echoes going around in the house. So we're going to turn some of it down because everybody's kind of live online right now. But so we can get at least a few of the yeah we're gonna turn off some of the cell phones inside the house we have a lot of phones so it's still pausing and freezing but we're gonna you may have to turn yours down too. around the house you just never know with this technology uh in the middle of the country in nashville how it's gonna work out but as i was saying Today, we're going to be talking about race relations um, with an incredible one of the founders from Privilege to Promise organization. We're going to talk about um, how they met. We're going to talk about their story. And I'm going to dive right into it as soon as we uh, are able to get some of the technology, a couple of people to turn off the Wi-Fi in our house <laughs> so we won't get echo. Okay, so I'm going to pull my guest in. Okay, there we are. Hello, Milk Carton Kids. And Nia, everyone joining us. I'm waiting for Michelle Sahini to join us right now. And we're going to be diving into uh, just talking about race relations. As you all know, as I said before, things got spotty that the Warren Treaty is a place. Uh, hello. Hi. How are you? Oh, wonderful. How are you? I'm doing great. Sorry for the technology problems, but you know, it's just one of those things. We've all been dealing with it with the Wi-Fi, you know, it just depends on where you live. So thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> thank you. And uh, I was just telling our listeners that you know as a band uh, my name is Tanya it's my first time meeting you and uh, in the duo with my husband uh, Michael Charter and we just wanted to uh, bring you on today because we've had the benefit of being able to tour the country with a message of love and uh, really disarm uh, a lot of our counterparts whether they're African Americans or white Americans or Asian Americans or Hispanic Americans to be able to get into conversation uh, just by giving them our music and, and dealing with it with love. And um, that's really what I love about when I saw your organization, you all saw a problem and together united and jumped right into it. So I just wanted to tell you, to have you tell us, Michelle, uh, how did you all decide to come together with, uh, from, privilege to promise to progress yes yeah, so um at privilege to progress it was a um it was a very organic collaboration um but it came about specifically from um unfortunately a moment of racial discrimination that melissa and i happened to witness at the same time so um I don't know if you're familiar with the um, with the Starbucks racial discrimination event that happened in April of 2018 in Philadelphia. That's when two black men were arrested for not buying a coffee. Yes. Uh, I was the first person to notice it. I was the first person to speak up. Um, and I saw the whole thing happen from beginning to end. I saw them walk in. And you know, it's really interesting because I purposely would avoid that Starbucks. I lived in Philly for five years when this happened. And I would, I had only been to that Starbucks one time in five years. And I would walk past it because I didn't feel like it was diverse enough. Mm -hmm. So for some reason that day I decided to, because it was, it, it's in the richest part of the city. Uh -huh. So, I, which is gentrified. Mm -hmm. So I was like, you know what? I don't really feel comfortable here, but for some reason that day, that day I decided to go there and when I was in there and these two gentlemen walked in, there were only four black people in the whole Starbucks. Me, one of the gentlemen, and these two men that were discriminated against. And they came in and then they asked to use the bathroom. And the barista said it was for paying customers only. And they said, okay. And they sat down and that was it. 
-hmm. Now, um, she walked away from herself and I remember watching her kind of mouth something to herself. And my first thought, my gut instinct said, I think she just said something racist. I don't know why I thought that. I don't know why that was just an initial feeling, but when you have those thoughts and feelings, it's really important that you have a reflective moment and check yourself. Because I didn't really know what she said. I wasn't close enough to, to hear it. I just saw her lips moving. So I said, Michelle, you have no idea what she just said. Now you're being prejudiced against this woman and you have no idea what she said. Mm -hmm. So I said, I told myself basically to put my head down and, and keep working. And within a few minutes, the cop showed up, which I thought was very weird because I had been there for almost an hour and that nothing had happened. So I had thought that they were responding to something from earlier in the day, maybe, maybe even responding to something there, nothing had happened. Um, but I was close enough to her at this point and the officers that I heard them speaking and I actually heard her lie. And I heard her say, this is for, or those two men, men in the corner are refusing to leave. Mm -hmm. And I immediately thought to myself, oh, maybe what I thought was correct. Maybe she did say something racist when she walked away because I'm watching her lie. And I'm watching her point to the only two other black men in the Starbucks. There's only four of us, but you want them to leave? This doesn't make any sense. So I start getting very, very nervous. The cops didn't ask any follow-up questions. There was no... There was no discourse. There was no information gathering. They just beelined for these two guys immediately. So I immediately started getting nervous. I immediately started getting anxious because I thought to myself, I do not, I cannot handle seeing an act of police violence. I, I don't, I won't watch videos. I haven't seen Amistad. I haven't seen 12 Years a Slave. I can't watch violence against Black people bodies any bodies really but because it happens to us so often i can't watch it because there's always that feeling of is this person getting away with it so i stood up and i looked at them and they looked at me very briefly but looked at the cops because the three of us realized something fishy is happening right now and they walked over to these guys and they were telling them that, that they had to leave and they were like this doesn't make any sense why would we have to go we're here waiting for people like everybody else is why do we have to leave and they're well because the, the manager doesn't want you here and she's allowed to ask you to leave but they're like but you need to explain to us why you would want us to leave so in that moment their friend actually showed up that they were waiting for who happened to be a white man a white jewish man and he said how is this not obviously racial discrimination it's starbucks i, I was there for 45 minutes there was a white guy next to me for 45 minutes he didn't buy a coffee I saw a white woman come in mid jog, use the bathroom and leave. And I remember thinking to myself, I wonder if she works here part time or if she's here so often that they know her because, you know, sometimes when you're a person of color, you police your own body. I would never just walk into a Starbucks, use the bathroom and leave. I'm too, I'm, I'm, I, I go in there and I'll buy something small just so I don't draw attention to myself. Like I'm trying to be a freeloader and use, I don't know why I just, it's just something that, that, that we do. So um two cops turned to six cops turned to eight cops to arrest these guys essentially for not buying coffee is what i came down to um and i confronted the barista and i asked her why she called the cops and her face and chest got about as bright as your beautiful red lipstick and she was like uh i i don't i don't know why i don't know why i i, I can't really tell you why well she didn't realize that i had been watching the whole time and I said, I know why. I said, did you feel like your life was in danger? And she ignored me. She actually walked down the Starbucks aisle. And so I followed her down the aisle. I don't know if not going to ignore me. So I asked her again. I said, did you feel like your life, like you were being threatened? And she ignored me again. So at this point, oh, and by the way, the reason that I even approached her in the first place is because I first approached the police officer. And I said, why are you doing this? Even though I was sweating, I was anxious. I was physically shaking because I didn't know what was going to happen to me if I approached the police. I mean, I'm watching them arrest two black guys for not buying coffee. If I speak up, what's going to happen to me? But in that moment, it wasn't a matter of, am I going to do something? It was, what am I going to do? Because what was the most frustrating thing to me is that 
It was an entire Starbucks of people and no one was saying anything or doing anything. Nobody. People who didn't have coffees weren't saying anything. So I went up to the police officer and I said, why are you doing this? And he told me to go ask the barista, which I thought was very interesting. I was like, oh, is that how this works now? So I, we could just call you when you want someone removed from your space and you just do whatever I say. It's not really how it works for us, but interesting that you're telling me to go ask the barista. So I said, okay. And that's when I approached her and asked her this question. She ignored me. So when she wouldn't respond to me, I, I stood back and I screamed at her and I said, you're an effing coward. And I walked back to my table and I'm packing up all my stuff and I'm looking around and all these white women are staring at me and they all start standing up. And Melissa was the only other person to actually verbally address the Starbucks that day. Well, was, let, me, let, let me stop you right there so that people will know who Melissa is. Melissa is your partner. She's um, now my partner, yes. She's now your partner. So she was there at the Starbucks. Melissa, am I saying it right, DePino? Correct. She's, your par she's now your partner, but she is a white woman. Yes. Was inside the Starbucks when this was going on, and she witnessed what was going on as well. Correct. She's now your partner. Correct. But we didn't know each other that day. Okay. Um, complete strangers, but she was the only person to actually verbally address the entire Starbucks. Um, the only white person to address the entire Starbucks of mostly, literally 96% white people who were there and most didn't have coffees. And she said, you know, I come here all the time. I was just here yesterday. I was here for hours. No one ever asks me to leave, and you know why. Um, and then we basically staged a walkout. Everyone walked out together. Someone actually tried to buy the coffees to let them out of hand. If, it's like, if this is really about coffee, then here, here are the coffees. Um, we watched them get put in the cop car, hands behind their backs, taken off for not buying coffees. Um, I remember she approached me and asked me about a Twitter caption. And at the time, I didn't have a Twitter. I didn't have a Facebook. I only had Instagram. I was barely on Instagram. And when it went viral, I had no idea for like two days. I had people calling me and texting me and saying, Michelle, the story that you told me about that happened to you the other day at, at Starbucks that you witnessed is going viral. I can hear your voice in the background. And I wasn't going to call anyone and, and, and be like, oh, it was me. But it was interesting because media had been flooding Melissa's inbox trying to talk to her mm -hmm. and she's trying to tell them all I did was share a video it was the black woman that said something why don't we believe people of color when they talk about their experiences wow that's powerful yes that, and you know and that's how this all came about that's we, this we realized, organization. the world was talking about it the world was realizing what racism could actually look like today because mm -hmm. had we not done anything had we not said anything Everybody in that Starbucks would probably think that they still don't ever see racism. Mm -hmm. You see it. You just don't recognize yeah. it. You're not you just it. don't. You don't recognize it. And it's interesting that you say that because one of our um, one of our friends was 16 years of age. She can't be on here right now, but she attends a school that's in a probably 95 percent uh, white community from an area we came from, which is in Michigan. Um, uh, they're very, very close to uh, uh, Albion, Michigan. And she was saying that, you know, she experiences racism all the time, but because it's, people see it and don't know that it's happening, you know, and we've had so many, the reason why I wanted you on here, because our fan base is probably 95% white. You mm -hmm. know, we, we um, probably within a six month span of touring, we may see, I would say 20 black people throughout the whole tour. Wow. You know, in the audience. And the thing that I have, that we have been able and fortunate enough to have a message of love that is disarming where people can feel like Melissa, where they can come up to you and be able to talk about racism and it be a safe place. I think a lot of people that don't look like you or me really do want to have the conversation. They want to have it, but it's like, how do you have this conversation that is a tough one without someone getting offended? or without someone, you know, uh, lashing out, because this is not just Black history, it's our history as Americans. It's American history. It's American history. And I think, you know, I had a guest, one of my uh, girlfriends was on the show a couple of uh, weeks ago, and she said something that was just a one-liner that just, I, I actually put it in almost everything I think about. Most of the things we're hysterical about is from history. We're yeah. hysterical about it because you know, it's our history. It's stored into the back of our minds. It's the stories that we've heard from grandma and granddaddy and 
all these different people, but you know, our stories are going to be different. We're not being hung from trees, but it's a different look that like racism looks differently. And, you know, I wanted to talk to you about that because, um, we did have a tour manager of ours who stood up for my husband when we were in Canada. He was treated in a racist manner by one of the waiters. And she stood up and was like, we don't have to take this. You know, you don't have to take this. Ruthie, Ruth, that was Ruthie's quote, by the, by the way. And she got it, Ruthie Lindsay, and she got it from someone else. But um, she stood up and she stepped up to the waiter and, and made him address what was going on, made the hotel address what was going on. Wow. But I think that is the new way that we can fight this you know when we think about martin luther king and we think about marcus garvey and uh, all the people Love marcus yeah you know the, the 60s who had their there were white people fighting with them you know there were white heroes that we don't talk about you know and i just wanted to you know bring light to this national movement that you all have that's you know really desegregating the the conversation because we are segregated physically, but the conversation is also segregated. Absolutely. And that's because yeah. our social media is segregated. Like, yeah. there was a study um, that Melissa found that said that if you're white, it's likely that your social media network is 91% white. And if wow. you're black, it's 88% black. So the stories that we're posting literally aren't crossing the timelines of white people. Mm -hmm. So they don't see what we see. They don't see what we see. Not only are they not seeing it on their timelines, but because racism is so um covert and it's just weaved into all like all of our 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 industries and, and and every fabric of our society because it's a part of everyday life in america it's almost invisible to them yeah yeah and a lot of things are invisible to us too you yeah know? we we don't you know we a lot of like, what we do is americana music when we say that to a person that looks like us they're like well what is that <laughs> you know we're like well it's music of America and you know the history of America is the tambourine and the banjo right. and the guitar and so it's like everybody's on a miss we, we want to understand so many things but we don't understand it does that make sense that makes a thousand percent sense because mm -hmm. I'm actually I'm first generation Ghanaian American and I grew up in a white town I experienced racism and microaggressions my entire life and I wanted so badly to be, to have more black friends, to be connected with black Americans. But because my parents couldn't tell me, I mean, they didn't even know like really all the history of this country. And because I wasn't taught the history in my, in my school, why would I? I'm the only black you know, kid in school. We were taught a very whitewashed history. I didn't understand what was really going on. I felt it, experienced it, I saw it but I didn't have any explanation for it. Yeah. And it was only when I started to educate myself about systemic oppression that I started to understand Black Americans more. And I started to just very naturally gain more Black friends because I could see them in a different way. I could empathize with them. I could understand their struggle. That's like with any situation. I mean, you're not gonna make friends with someone if you don't get to know them. Mm -hmm. And the yeah. problem is that white America purposefully been fed a book of lies their entire life to separate them from even ever having to get to know us their neighborhoods are separated their schools are neighborhoods you know schools segregated are, are it's 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 going on all over the country and so it's a melting pot but because of redlining and other very racist practices we're very, very still segregated. And you have to go out of your way to educate yourself about what this country was really founded upon. I mean, yeah. like, you know, sometimes I used to ask myself, why do black Americans join the armed forces when there's so much racism in the army? There's so much racism in the army. There's so much racism in this country. And I had to remind myself, this is just as much the country of black people as it is white people. They yeah. built the country. Yeah, it's, this people, is our this is our history. This is American yes, history. white people. And I mean, it. people don't know, but people built built. I'm sorry, black people built the White House. The mm -hmm. first person born in the White House was actually um, a black individual. Like, they, like it's it, like we we've been here since 1619. So how is it not just as much? How did we not have just as many rights and equality and equity as everybody else?
And I tell, and, you know, if a white American says to me, you know, why does everything have to be about race? Why do you have to talk about race so much? We will stop talking about it when it's actually equal. I will stop talking about racism when it stops. Mm -hmm. Because I don't know any problem that solves itself on its own. I always give the analogy, you can cut your finger, and if you don't take care of your finger, it, it can get infected, and it turns into gangrene, and you have to cut your arm off. <laughs> like, like, like I, I don't know any problem that doesn't, that solves itself. And if we yeah, and I think, and I think what you're doing with Melissa, you all coming together, a black woman and a white woman coming together, because I think that is the core of the conversation. The conversation is, we have to sit at the same table and be able to say, here's my history, here's your part, and, and here's your history, and come to an understanding that yes, it's happening. It's you know, people are being killed. It's there, but together. You know, this is the bridge that we can build it on. You know, we have to understand, yes, this is the history, but what do we do now? What do we, know, do, what do, we now? What do we do now? And and I think what you all did by coming together, two people just seeing you from the outside, a black person and a white person, have these conversations and it's not hostile. You know, usually when I watch uh debates or things like that the race, there's a lot of hostility there where people who aren't they don't want to offend. They don't want to say anything because it's a sensitive subject. They don't even want to get involved because it's so tough and they don't want to be judged. You know, it's, it's shame something? and guilt. It's yeah. shame and guilt. But you know, I tell people, would you expect to go into a classroom that you've never subject, a brand new subject and take a test and get an A plus? No. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And the conversation, you know, even with the shame and guilt, it's, I think that's the thing that we have to, as black people, create a safe space you know yes they have their shame and yes we may have our anger but there has to be a safe place where the conversation can go beyond this is what you did to me this is what your people did to me and this is what blah 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 and you all be and what you all have done in that starbucks you said hey look i saw it i'm a white woman i witnessed it i'm a black woman and we have to come together to have the race conversation that you know, no one really wants to have. We deal with it no. every day in our business. You know, it's very vivid that you might be the only black person on your team doing the kind of music that we're doing. You right. know, but what we have had to realize that even when black people come to us and they're like, "Well, you all are doing that white music," or if you indulge in that conversation, mm -hmm. then you're a part of it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. You become a part of the perpetuating cycle of racism. Correct. You know, and, and so it has to stop with the conversation. It has to stop with, you know, I'm sure that people in their homes as black people have conversations around their children that they don't really want that to get out. Or I'm sure, some yeah. white people may have that conversation in their homes about certain things that they don't want to get out. So I think we have to put on, we, don't, we have to stop putting on the face in public mm -hmm. for what we are and we have to live it out. We you have know. to live it out. And mm -hmm. I always say, you know, we always say that shame and guilt are not, they're not, they're not really useful emotions, to mm -hmm. be honest. They stop yeah. you from progressing. They stop you from learning. They stop you from speaking up. Um, and I always try to remind white people, I'm like, listen, it is not your fault that you were born into this system of oppression. You couldn't mm -hmm. help where you were born. It's not your fault that you were literally fed these types of images um, and biases your entire life. Because guess what? I grew up in a white town, and even though I'm African American, like literally like first generation African, I even had the biases as a black woman mm -hmm. to the point where I experienced so much racism and I knew what white people thought about black people that I tried to separate myself from black America. Mm. And I wanted to say, no, 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 I'm not black American, I'm African. Yeah. Because I recognized that for whatever reason, well, I, there, there, there are a few reasons. I, that that responded better with, with, with people people seemed to accept me more and suddenly I went from being a black girl to being interesting and mm -hmm. oh you're African and I said okay you know what it, it was it was a means of survival for me yeah it was I don't want to keep experiencing this let me hold on to this identity for as long as I possibly can so I can just get through this party or yeah. get through this lunch or mm -hmm. you know have people stop looking at me funny or um, and so I started to also absorb biases about Black Americans. That's how deep racism gets into. And I'm Black. Yeah, that's very true. That's you very know? true. 
my mother was from Panama, and I can tell you that mm. I, you know, she's a Pan a black Panamanian, but I never heard her call herself a black Panamanian. And I was expressing that to, I think I was talking to my husband, I was saying, you know, when you grow up with a different, even though the skin is the same, right. culturally, they hold on to a culture that they picked up and they perpetuate certain things or you hear certain things about how Americans are. So there's this separation even in being an African American that, oh, I'm Panamanian, like you said, that's more interesting just saying, hey, look, I'm from Washington, D.C. Southeast, <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's, 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 it's just very different. And I think yeah. even with that, that's a whole nother conversation. Whole nother conversation. Within <laughs> itself. But what I wanted to do with this particular call, because I, you know, I feel like we had a friend of ours over um, at our house one day, and he said, you know, I have a lot of stuff to say, but I feel like as a white person, I don't have a right to say it. Mm. You know, I feel like if I say it, I'm going to get shut down. So I have some questions from one of my friends who is who actually is a white American. He, uh, he plays in our band, and he had uh, some questions regarding race relations that I wanted to, you know, have you answer. There may be some other sure. questions on here that people may have. Um, his question is: How, as a white male, do I serve as an advocate and be proactive without overshadowing, patronizing? all while listening to various opinions from POC. You educate yourself and you do just that, you listen. Mm -hmm. You read the books, you watch documentaries, you listen. And even more importantly, I think that it's really important that white Americans understand what it means to be white in this country. Mm -hmm. So much is focused on um, like our experiences, which is very, very, it's like, you know, we, we, we want you to understand our experiences. We want you to hear, we want you to listen to us. We, we want you to believe us when we, when we say something is racist, but it is so important to understand what it means to be white in America and what privileges you have. Mm -hmm. That to me is everything because there are even some people that, white people that I've experienced, you know, you know, when you call them white, they think, calling them white is racist it, it, like it, because they don't understand that white is the default in this country and i think once you start from a place where you recognize your privileges and really understand that and understand that you move through the through the world differently than your black band members yeah and listen to the experiences that's when you can really start to i think make a difference to the people around you even mm -hmm. like even stronger you know pointing out those privileges, recognizing those privileges. Um, the thing that I wish that I would have had more of growing up were white friends that just listened to me and believed me. Mm -hmm. Part of the reason that I stopped talking about race for so many years was because my white friends didn't believe me. Mm -hmm. Even though they loved me and I know that they had good intention, when I would talk about racism, they would say, are you sure that that really happened? I don't think he really meant that, you know, or they'd wait till after the fact. Then they would say, I'm so sorry that happened. Well, where were you in the moment? That's what happened with my husband. And that's exactly what he said, you know, about the, one of the people that was there. It was like, well, they were laughing at him, but they were laughing at the situation and it wasn't funny. And our tour manager at the time, she went up to the person and was like, no, you do not, just, and she's white, you don't deserve mm -hmm. to be treated like that. And, you know, that goes into my next question of what he said on here. He says, you know, how can we follow through as a white male uh, productively in his own outrage? Because mm. he was outraged, you know. She was, when this happened to my husband, furious about it, mm -hmm. you know, as a white woman. And it would have come off differently had I said something. Absolutely. You know, and I realized that I was like, you know, I used my restraint because I knew that it would have been, we're in Canada, we could have been locked up, you know, had right. two black people say we're being mistreated. So I think that you know, in itself is a way that you handle the outrage is to say something and to uh, partner like, like you and Melissa did, you know, with this organization. Yeah. And, and, and talk to your friends and family, talk mm -hmm. to the people around you, talk to your, talk to your white community about what you are learning. Mm -hmm. Share that with other people in, in, in your world and get them to join you. Yeah. The path to being anti-racist. Yeah. Share Share with them the books that you're reading. Share the documentaries that you're watching. Um, if, you're, if you go to a, a, a Black-owned restaurant or, or a Black event, 
bring them with you. Have yeah. them, like, have them immerse themselves in what it may be like to be the only one in situations. I mean, my, my best friend came with me to a, um, a family party of mine once. She was the only mm -hmm. one person there because we're, we're, we're all African. And afterwards she goes, Shelly, is this what you feel like often? And I was like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm, like, I, is, I'm like, is it weird? She's like, a little bit. And I'm like, and I, I know you have to just, you know, grin and bear it. But she yeah. said, it, it put it in such perspective for her. She was like, I am going to be so much more mindful even when I invite you to events that I'm going to. Because like, she didn't realize that when, when, the, when people invite me to events, I have to think about what's going to be the demographic of people that are there. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I'm not in an emotional, mental place to be able to, to want to have to even deal with being the only one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and likewise, it's us, ex us as Black Americans being able to expose our people to another place, another world. Yeah. As you said, social media alone shows the division. You know, exactly. you're only paying, if you're only following and doing things with people that look like you, then that's a problem. <laughs> that's a problem. Because, because the world has, is diverse. You know, if you're only eating fried chicken and watermelon, <laughs> then you have a problem right. because Thai food is so damn good. You know what I mean? Amazing. <laughs> I, and you need to have a Thai, a friend who can, who can cook it. So I think that is it. We overall have to open up our minds to how big the world is. The world it's, is huge. It's huge. You're from, your people are from Ghana. My family's yeah. from Panama and Cuba and Peru, you know. And we're here in America and you have, you know, it's just, I think that it's a scenario that's happening all the time. But what I've found in all of this, and especially with touring and being, and only having, you know, a 95% white fan base is that everybody wants the same thing. We do. We wanna, you know, we want to be able to take care of our families and, and, and love on our people and, you know, be able to be safe. Those are the basics of humanity that we want. Love, <laughs> you know? acceptance, safety, yeah. honesty. We want to be able to, to, to bring our full, like, we want to be able to be ourselves in, all, in every situation. And you yeah. have to ask yourself if you are operating in a way that it's allowing someone else to be their full selves in a situation. Yeah. And that <laughs> size all of us up, you know, exactly. there are different kinds of black people. Not all of us are out here twerking right. and rapping and right. doing all this kind of stuff. There are different kinds of black women. There are black women like Lizzo. There are black women that dress vintage. There are black women like you that wear head wraps. You know, not all of us are over-sexualized or not all the black guys are wearing their pants hanging down. And likewise for, you know, on the other side, not all blondes are ditzy and <laughs> the stereotypes. Girl, I was in Ghana this <laughs> This past year, it's funny because I was like, I, I love house music and I was always one of the only black people at, at, at house shows. It was almost all white people. And I, and just this past year when I was in Ghana, I was at a Burner Boy concert. He's a really popular Nigerian um, Afrobeats artist. He's absolutely incredible. Everybody go listen to Burner Boy. He's just, he's incredible. And I look over and I see this blonde white girl next to me in Ghana. I look behind me and there's this white European guy and, we're, and everybody's just jamming to Burner Boy in Africa. Yeah, it was just the most amazing. It was just the most amazing. Ex it was literally the best night I think I've had in yeah. my life. Because Asian. we're better. Yeah, Asian. We're better together. We are. Exactly. We're better when I'm sitting in front of the keyboard. My husband has this scenario, and I'm going to pull him in to the conversation in a few minutes, uh, bring the other half of one treaty in. But this piano, he has this scenario mm -hmm. where, you know, and I want him to tell it better than, than I can. Mm -hmm. But we we all he's gonna run away from me now because I'm trying to put him. <laughs> but we all are, you know, when you put this keyboard together and you start making sounds with the piano, if you play just the black keys, it's not gonna get to do what you want. But when you play right. all the keys together, this is beautiful piece of art. Right. That comes out of it. You know what I mean? And he, right. he explains it so much better than I, I can, but that's just the way that I believe the world has to work. I grew up with a Spanish speaking black mother and when right. I went to school I was teased because she had an accent mm. at a black school you know it was maybe 10% right. white people at the school but my, I was ashamed because they were like what kind of accent is that your mother can't even say air and she would say hair and, and drop the H air you know it was hard yeah. for her to speak the language with her thick accent and then you know so inside the grouping of even who we are as African Americans it has to stop 
It has know, to stop. Because if we're doing it, then we can't expect any other culture to treat us any differently. I agree. I agree a thousand percent. I, 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 I feel like I'm actually starting a podcast about this specifically about just like the unity amongst the diaspora and, in, and the unity uh, amongst black Americans. But I feel as though, you know, what, what sometimes I, I want white people to understand when they see us acting that way towards one another, I want them to kind of try to understand that that again comes from a place of being in an environment where you are always put down. That's what you've been taught. Mm -hmm. You yeah. live in a society where the outside, where white supremacy just beats you down all of the time and makes you feel low about yourself because people that love themselves don't act that way. No, they don't. And you know, I, my brother said something, Will Morrell, he said something the other day and he had a post up and it said that people have to heal and stop trying to make your pain look like this culture. It's not culture <laughs> for you to, you know, that's not a part of our culture. We come from class. We come from education. That's not a part of our culture. You go to <laughs> Africa, you never hear the N-word. The N-word yeah, is not said in Africa. Wow. They don't that's say it. The, that's one of the first things that I noticed. I was like, black men in Ghana, they don't say the N-word because it's not part of their culture. And, and again, yeah. because it's such a, now this is, I, I don't want to, like, anyone can say it. I, I, know, I don't want to stop it. I don't want if they feel. But what you just said about, about like, basically masking your pain as culture. Yeah. To me, that's exactly what that is. Yeah, that's it's a very not, American. That, that's that, that 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 is an American term that Black people have tried to take back. And to me, I'm like, that's that's masking the pain. That's every time I hear that word, I get a little. Yeah, to me, it's a very low vibrational word. It's why would you refer to someone as that when you can refer to them as a king? Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, it, it, so it's it's max as culture, and and we so when you have this, on one hand, you have black people like yourself or myself or others or white people like you know that are watching this that want to better the world, and then you have this other part, and then it's like I don't know if you how do you have a child that you're going to put into this traumatic I know. environment, you I know. know. So now you're. I grew up in Prince George's County, which is the richest county for African Americans. That's where I grew up. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, my parents moved, my mom moved from Panama, my dad over to America, and we lived there. And I remember watching that community just grow. You know, I remember growing up with black doctors and lawyers. It wasn't Beautiful. the Cosby show for me. It was my real life. You know what I mean? And then That's I started- That's why I love that show. That's why I love that show. Because I was, I was like, oh, that makes sense to me. You know what I mean? It makes sense. And then you go to a historic black college and you start learning all these different things about yourself. But I never felt the hate for white people or, you know, right. my best friend growing up. I feel like I'm one of, I feel like what she used to say, my best friend growing up, she was like, yeah, you're my black friend. I was like, don't say that. Yeah. <laughs> but it wasn't a big deal for us because racism wasn't, you know, you're not going to get strangled and killed for saying it. We were kids. You know what I mean? She would say, this is my chocolate friend. And we laugh about it. So yeah. I'm really just, you know, I really wanted you to come on because I think people need to see uh, what you all are doing. I, I, I watched you on uh, the Jada Pickett's Red Table. Oh, thanks. <laughs> yeah, and, um, and what you said there. And I just think that people need to know that, you know, there are people that are working together to make this happen. And I wanted to, before I let you go, find out exactly what does that look like between you and, you and um, Melissa when you are doing events together? So when we're doing events together, um, we both share our story. We share how the Starbucks story, how the From Privilege to Progress came about. Um, we share a bit of history about each one of us and how we grew up and how we um, came to understand the, the system that, that we live in, um, what it was like for her growing up as a, as a white woman, what it was growing up for like, as me as, as, a, as a black woman. And then we really try to encourage people and model the conversation for others on how to have these conversations between people who don't look like one another. Mm -hmm. Like you said, it, does, it doesn't have to be heated. We're all experiencing trauma. You know, we, you know, it's, you know, we, we all come from, from a place where we've been taught to not talk about it. So it's not going to be, it's not natural in this yeah. country to talk about race. Mm -hmm. um, but just like any friendship, just like any relationship, when you talk about things that are tough and difficult, the depth of your friendship increases. Yeah. The trust increases. The empathy increases. The unity increases. I mean, 
to me, this isn't just about race relations. It's even it's even about it's even about life coaching. I mean, when you can learn how to have tough conversations, yeah, that transmits to other areas of your life. Because if you have such a hard time talking about this, what else in your life are you avoiding talking about? That's so true. That's so true. That you nailed it. You nailed it. And, and so yeah, and we just and like we just tell people, you know, like what you can do. We believe that in order to have systemic change, it starts with the individual. We're not going to change mass world. incarceration. We're not yeah. going to we're not going to change, you know, all these racist policies that are put into place. But we can start to change it by the individual. Yeah, you need one to person change. at a time. One person at a time. So mm -hmm. educate yourself. Speak up in your everyday life. Amplify the voices of people of color, just like Melissa did with me. Like I spoke up, she amplified my voice by posting the video. And every time that someone would reach out to her, she would say, I'm bringing along Michelle because she's part of this conversation and you need to hear her. I love that. I love that. And people are asking how they can help. They want to know how they can help, how they can be a part of what it is that you're doing. Can you tell them? Is yes. There we have um there's resources that, that we, we, we love for people to read and watch. So um our one of our favorite books is White Fragility by Robin D'Angelo. She's a white woman who's been doing anti racism work. It's the book is called White Fragility, Why It's So Hard to Talk About Racism with White People. Um we recommend watching Thirteenth on Netflix by Ava DuVernay. Um that chronicles um from slavery all the way to mass incarceration. It is an absolutely incredible documentary. It blew my mind away. Uh, seen on radio, seeing white podcast. That is, again, just, it, it literally actually explains how race even started in this world because race isn't really even like a thing. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. It was literally created. So that's also absolutely incredible. And we want people to just take it upon themselves to um, join us on the path to anti-racism. Make sure that your family becomes, you know, make sure if you didn't come from an anti-racist family, make sure one comes from you. Yeah. Um, you know, educate yourself, come to our page, share our content. Can you your, give them your page? Give, the, uh, her pay, give them your website where they can find you and follow you? And Yeah, and so um, our page is Priv to Prague. Um, you can type in From Privilege to Progress or P-I-R-V-T-O-P-R-O-G. Um, come to our page. Um, like I said, share our content. Our website is from privilege to progress.org. Mm -hmm. um, and we really want people to especially share our content to really break down their social media networks and get this information out to everybody and ask your friends and family to join you. Yeah, I love it. Getting yourself. I love it so, so much. And I, I really want to, you know, really meet you and I thank you for- We'll meet when the COVID is over. <laughs> <laughs> and, your, and your time that you, you, you spent with me and I love the t-shirt, hashtag show up. And that's pretty much what you're saying. Show up, show up in your life, show up in these conversations. Uh, so I want to thank you so much. Am I saying your last name right, Michelle? Sahin. 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 Well, I actually, you know what? That's actually the American pronunciation. In Ghana, it's Sahin. Sahin. So, so it's I love that. so like yeah, we we pronounce, we pronounce all of our e's. So in Ghana, and like the a. So it's like so there's two a's. So it's like Sa Sahin. Sahin. Okay. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> it's beautiful. <laughs> it's beautiful. Well, you know, it's out of a very uh, traumatic. Uh, experience that you both experienced at that Starbucks because watching two black guys get taken away by cars, that's traumatic. Something amazing and something beautiful has come out of this. Yeah. And that's uh, from privilege to progress. And I'm exactly. so excited for you all and what you're doing for America. This is our history together, everybody, and together we can fix it. So, you know, we thank you so much <laughs> for joining me and um, hopefully we can continue this conversation when you all have time, some more time. And uh, I, I am just grateful that you came to be with us today. Thank you, Tanya. I appreciate you having me on. Thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Thank you all so much for uh, joining me. These conversations, you know, it's not where you can just have it one time and it will uh, go away. Michael and I have these conversations all of the time. Uh, we're looking for people that don't look like us to uh, start having these conversations because, you know, we, we can't depend on the government. We can't depend on uh, laws. We have to be the answer. We have to be the thing that's going to turn these things around. And I think just having the conversations and being honest about it and expressing ourselves in a safe place of love where we can, um, where we can talk about these things without it being hostile. You know, that's what any relationship, if you create a space, 
where you're able to talk about it and you're able to say what you need to say without feeling rejection or you know feeling like you're going to get stomped on it's easier for you to say hey look here's what i'm feeling here's why i feel that way about you here's what happened to me you know and uh then we can talk about it because I think there's so much room for us to talk about why black women are look like this, why white women are look like looked at like this, black men, you know, the list goes on and on and on and on. So um, I would just encourage you uh, to do as Michelle uh, asked, you know, get involved, show up, you know, I, it, even, you know, we, we on the road, you all know a lot in this industry that we're in Americana, it's not a lot of people that look like us. So we're, so we're introducing this music to people that look like us because that's a part of the responsibility is not to stand on it and say, hey, look, we created that, even though we did. But it's to introduce people, to remind them that, hey, look, the guitar belongs to you too. The banjo belongs to you too. And likewise, for people that want to do R&B music or people that want to do gospel music, you know, this is American music. This is America. We're all here. We're not going anywhere. You're not going anywhere. We're not going anywhere. So we might as well figure out how to get along in love and create this beautiful space that we could all be in. Um, and I just want to encourage you, if you're not um, a part of Hartstown, uh, the community, uh, the Warren Treaty, where it's safe for you to say what you want to say and ask those questions. And, you know, for it to be difficult, it may be hard for you, um, then go there. Let's talk about it. Send us questions. And this is a safe space. And we're going to um, keep this conversation going. Michael is saying we should do a part two. I think we should. And I think that if you're one of the people that um, have experienced racism or if you are a person that's not of uh, Afro -dis African descent and you want to say some things and you've been wanting to say it, but you don't want to offend anybody, then let me just say something. Sometimes in a relationship, uh, Michael and I are married now for 10 years, sometimes you will get offended. It's a part of being in a relationship. But what happens is, as my mother used to say, you eat the meat and you spit out the bone. You hear what the person has to say, even if you don't like how they're saying it, and you digest it so that you can understand what they're saying. So this is a place where we won't judge you. This is a place where we won't uh, condemn you. This is a place where we won't look at you any differently because the foundation, whenever you're talking to anybody, should be a place of love. It should be a place of listening. It should be a place of, of, you know, safety. And where you have that, anything is possible. So I just wanted to thank everybody for joining me on the second part of Tanya Tuesday today. I look crazy for doing two shows, but I really wanted to talk about these two issues because it was just heavy on my heart, you know, watching the propaganda of how um, – this new case is going to go on with uh, the young man who was shot down in, in Georgia, you know, and understanding our responsibility and the conversations that we all have to have with the Warren Treaty and, and Hartstown and you all, the conversation that we have to have in order so that we can keep looking at each other with love and we can understand what's going on. So thank y'all so much for um, joining me and thank you uh, from Privilege to Progress for joining me. Thank you, Michelle. And like I said to her, her, you know, out of a tragic situation uh, in Philadelphia in a Starbucks where two people, a white woman and a black woman, watched something happen. They both decided, you know what, we're going to come together and we're going to create an organization where the white person is saying what she saw and the black woman is saying what she saw and we're going to walk together in understanding so that this world can be a better place. So thank you so much. I love you. I will continue to love you. And yes, his name was Ahmad Arbery. Correct. And um, I will see you next week. Hopefully we might uh, continue the conversation next week. All right. Have a good day. Enjoy your time with your family. We're all still on quarantine. Be safe. Wash your hands. Do all the things that you know to do to be safe during this time. All right. I enjoyed you. Love you. Bye-bye.